Um, I would, I'm very inspired by what you're doing with the civic tech movement here in Taiwan. I'm curious how you personally got involved uh -huh. in what drove you to uh -huh. to the civic tech. Yeah, to the civic tech community out of uh -huh. everything else. What is your why? And what, what is unique about Taiwan culture that uh -huh. you think allows for civic tech to thrive? Okay, uh, how long have you been staying in Taiwan? Um, my parents are Taiwanese, okay. but I grew up and I'm involved in the civic tech movement in the U.S. Okay, yeah. cool. Uh, which coast? Uh, so I spent many years in D.C. Ah, uh, okay, that coast. <laughs> but, but I also spent a lot of time yeah. in California. Ah, uh, okay, both yeah. coasts. Like, so. Okay, and in my dexterous. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, I think Taiwan, uh, personally speaking, uh, I remember uh, the martial law as a very young kid. Yeah. Uh, so I'm always interested because my both my parents are journalists uh, in how tech can enable new forms of public communication that's based on listening at scale, not just speaking at scale. Mm -hmm. uh, and because our first presidential election, which was in '96, uh, is already after the wild web, um, so I also participated a little bit uh, in the initial campaigning. Uh, the candidate supported the win, by the way, in '96. But but already people start thinking democracy is a form of technology because people already have a taste of how you know um, multi to multi. Uh, listening skill could work. So we designed into a lot of our constitutional amendments after the democratization uh, the sort of listening skill that's enabled by the World Web movement. Um, and so personally I got involved in the free software movement, later on open source movement and so on around um, the turn of century. Uh, and then uh, because uh, my day job uh, is just about social interaction design, about making things like Slack nowadays. Uh, so during the Occupy movement in 2014, uh, we applied whatever we learned uh, in the past few years uh, with the Silicon Valley um, like enterprise social uh, companies into the occupier communication network uh, to pretty good uh, results. So people in Taiwan saw that demonstration doesn't need to be protest, it could be a demo. Right, it could show that uh, listening scale actually works even for national level issues uh, that originally like train negotiation uh, should be the subject matter um, like experts, the threshold should be really high but with good design and everybody can actually get to it much like how in Taiwan without lockdown we made sure that people understood the epidemiologically uh, informed measures and so on and people can actually co-design such measures to reduce the basic transmission uh, numbers and these were not uh, you know the, within the confines of the Central Academic Command Center, but rather anyone can help. No, that's great. Um, what can I do? To, mm. So I, I, in the U.S., I was part of a program. I still serve as president of the foundation of mm. the Presidential Innovation oh, Fellows yeah. Foundation. Mm. And I would love to bring technologists into Taiwan government. Mm. You know, my Taiwanese identity is a mm. huge part of me. Um, mm. And I would love to see, mm. you know, government here use technology. Do you technology. have a dual nationality? Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. So you also have a passport here. Yes. Oh wow. Okay. So, uh, well, <coughs> if you are a citizen here, uh, I mean, it, it, it's up to you. Uh, how many months a year are you going to commit to be based in Taiwan, and how many months of the year are you going to be teleworking? Do, do you already know that? No. Are you there? COVID is very. <laughs> COVID is very strange, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, I think um, a couple of things come to my mind. Uh, one is that there's uh, the presidential hackathon, uh, which we're going to launch the, the next month. Uh, it's an annual thing, right? The president gives an award. It's a little bit like the 10 times um, movement uh, in the, I think, 18F uh, as well. Okay, as, yeah, yeah. Right? So the, the idea, uh, but instead the of just... Nice, yeah. Yeah, you're right. So 10x, instead of just um, committing budget, which is essentially what 10x does, um, it, this is committing presidential power. So executive branch power as hackathon prize. So every year we give out five trophies, and for each winner, um, we commit the trophy is a microprojector. If you turn it on, it projects the president committing to you. Whatever you did in the past three months will become national policy in the next 12 months. Wow, that's uh, amazing. Right, so um, I mean, maybe you can consider um, as a mentor uh, or as a participant, why not? Because you're a citizen, why not? Uh, <laughs> yeah. In one of the presidential hackathon uh, efforts here. And it allows anyone to participate. Exactly. That's really great. Because exactly. 10X only allows for government employees, so. Right, uh, yeah. of course, the presidential hackathon winners in each team, uh, there has to be at least one public sector uh, yeah. person. Uh, but also, we say it needs to be trisectoral. 
so at least one person from social sector and at least one person from the economic sector. So if the team composition wasn't like that in the beginning, uh, if uh, through a new voting method called quadratic voting, every year we choose 20 teams or so and we incubate them to be properly trisectoral. Wow, no, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so recently in the UK I helped, I was on the advisory board of a program through number 10 okay. that brings entrepreneurs into yeah. government. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious if there is a good, you know, back and forth mm -hmm. between technologists, you know, Taiwan's technology oh, yeah, talent, and mm -hmm. um, working in government, yeah. and what the perception is. Because I know mm -hmm. in the US, you know, many people choose like Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. hard to leave jobs, and you know, we, we try to build this mm -hmm. integrity of civic mm -hmm. culture of giving back and also making an impact. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are drawn mm -hmm. to the mission. So I've always been curious because yeah. I haven't been involved in Taiwan government. Uh, or okay. movement. Well, um, we're just launching literally yesterday the fifth uh, uh, yearly uh, call for internship uh, oh, to my office. Wow, that's really right. Right. So, so we get hundreds and uh, hundreds of applications uh, and we choose, say, 30 or so um, every uh, summer. Uh, to work on uh, service design, to uh, look at the pain points of the digital services and make um, you know the, the whole design process. You probably already are familiar with these, right? So um, yeah, I would say um, it's very enthusiastic. Uh, the fact that we've been running this for five years and each year with more uh, enthusiasm from the young people, usually around graduate level, uh, I think that's that's really heartwarming. Uh, and for uh, professionals, of course, um, we're now planning that uh, in the upcoming digital ministry, the competent authority for digital, the probably called MODA, uh, Ministry of Digital Affairs, uh, but we, we don't know yet. Um, next year uh, around, we'll probably have up to 100 people uh, from non-public service backgrounds, uh, but writing that into the foundational act that says, uh, you know, these people can actually become part of the public service within the MODA. Wow, that's yeah. really great. Mm -hmm. Um, so in the U.S., I worked on election security oh, you did. under um, under President Trump, and I okay. started under Obama. Okay. But I was under you know very interesting times where I know. the authority I know. of elections I know. was ground zero of the infodemic. Of the infodemic, <laughs> yes. So I, I spent a lot of time on online disinformation okay. and foreign influence operations. Uh -huh. But I'm curious about here in Taiwan. You know, there's obviously a lot of controversy with China with mm -hmm. other. Um, issues. How do you maintain integrity in election security infrastructure when it comes to disinformation? Oh, very, very simple. Uh, our tallying process uh, is okay. paper based, one hundred percent. Okay. Uh, and, and you don't um, have the states. <laughs> and, and and all the all the different parties have their own tallying app, okay. and we allow observers to take films. Mm. Uh, and so, like for each count, like literally, uh, the various different parties just count in tandem in real time. So each person, while they probably don't trust uh, the YouTubers on the other parties, they probably trust the YouTubers on their parties. Uh, and by making sure that um, it's, a, it's a fun uh, participatory, more than three quarter of population did vote uh, and very interested in looking at the telling results, and if the apps in various different parties do agree with one another, there's simply no room for rumor to grow. Uh, and so it's not like we didn't have rumors such as, you know, the CIA, always the CIA, printing uh, <laughs> invisible inks uh, on ballot paper, so no matter who you vote, your ink will fade and President Tsai's ink will appear, uh, and so on. Uh, so not unlike what US saw, um, but uh, these uh, do not spread. These do not have a higher R value because uh, if there's alleged controversy, uh, very quickly the YouTuber responsible for filming that particular tallying and in all different camps do publish the full uh, video, what, what was actually happening. Uh, and actually they're counting the members of parliament, um, the votes, not the presidential votes, and there's no invisible ink. Uh, so the fact that they counted um, that the fourth candidate, while there's only three presidential candidates, it was because it was for the MPs. Right, uh, and so on, and and so um, the um, it's like a, a counter spam network, right? People flag incoming email as spam for spam house to check. So that here, um, people flag uh, like down the line, which is entering encrypted channel, uh, as disinformation. And for say the Taiwan Fact Checker, Michael Penn, or the Gov Zero Network, uh, Cofax, and so on to cross check. And it's a real ecosystem. And so many people install 
or not really install, invite the chatbot into their chat rooms, such as the Trend Micro uh, bot, and as an anti scam, antivirus tool, which can also scan uh, incoming images. So, counter disinformation is just one of its many functions. Right, and it's also kind of phishing, among other things. Uh, and uh, Who's Call, which is a pretty popular startup, uh, also have their own, like Meiyu and so on. So there's an ecosystem of uh, real-time fact-checking going on, and it's crowdsourced, and therefore gaining its legitimacy by the fact that people of all different political parties do participate in this kind of cross-checking endeavor. No, that's great. Um, um, I'm I'm currently working in building a better decentralized web. Oh. I'm curious about your thoughts about government intervention and the decentralized web movement, the open source developers that are currently working on that. Um, I'm currently working on a project called Filecoin uh, that's built on IPFS. Um, so, I that, oh, great. Okay. So, um, I'm I, I'm just in general very curious because this so, is a so big debate. What role are you playing in the Filecoin? Ecosystem? Oh, I run the foundation. You run the foundation. Yeah. Oh wow! And you're in Taiwan. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, I think a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I think the civic tech, gov tech, uh, binary distinction um, sh um, it is a is a drawback, mm -hmm. um, and it's a uh, false binary. Uh, and uh, in Taiwan, almost all gov tech started as civic tech. Mm -hmm. um, and we call it forking the government, uh, right? <laughs> right? So fork with the intention of merging back, so a soft fork, I guess, yeah. right? Uh, and and that's, um, that's essential because that uh, ensures people don't just disappear when they go into the GovTech ecosystem, as we see in other jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. uh, rather, they maintain very good connections with their civic tech roots. The GovTech merely adds uh, penetration testing, um, integration, API design, and things like that, uh, that any large organization have to do anyway as part of the due diligence uh, in incorporating open source software, but it still stays open source, and we do contribute back to the civic tech ecosystem. Uh, I think government as a early adopter really helps a lot in legitimizing, uh, you know, emerging civic tech technologies, but it, it should not uh, actually take over and make it state-owned civic tech. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so, like, I guess in terms of you know de the decentralized web and when there is lack of centralization mm -hmm. in certain information bodies or certain mm -hmm. files, like in the case of file file rights in in data storage. Where do you think, what is the role of government? Should they play hands off? Mm -hmm. um, should they try to con you know, continue to prevent mm -hmm. bad things from happening? Should they guide in some way? So. No, I mean, if the ledger space, uh, because I'm also, I'm a, a slash, right? I'm digital Mr. TW, slash board member in like seven different international NGOs. Oh, okay. Right, right. so yeah. uh, on my radical exchange pad, for example, whenever uh, Vitalik and the Ethereum friends uh, come up with quadratic voting, we use it in the presidential hackathon. When it come up with zero knowledge, range proof we use in the national insurance uh, okay. house and, and, yeah. and, and things like that right so so the, the idea is that um, it, it's not about a hands-off or hands-on it's about the public service does not consider ourselves as confining the public space mm -hmm. but also we're also part of the social sector um, and so when the social sector innovation, the social innovation, the technologists uh, come up with something new, uh, we can actually contribute to it as a social sector person. Right? So for example, I help translating the counter disinformation quite a say, website from the digital ambassador uh, Henry Vedier of uh, the, the French um, foreign service. Uh, but I did that as a GitHub pull request. Um, uh, contributor, right? Yeah, Not yeah. as digitalminister.tw, yeah, yeah. uh, and but it did get merged in, and uh, there's a traditional Chinese, a Mandarin version of that website now, uh, and the translation itself is actually quite political, right? Um, mm -hmm. Just the fact that it's in French, English, and traditional Chinese yeah. speaks volumes, um, and 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 so that may be uh, seen as a diplomatic move but it's actually done by social sector collaboration. And, and the same goes for, for example, the, the Tokyo Metropolitan's, uh, the, the deputy mayor, I think, worked with COVID Japan uh, to make sure that the coronavirus um, counter strat coronavirus strategy dashboard is done in GitHub. Uh, and all it does is that uh, the Tokyo Metropolitan government give it a uh, government website domain name. Uh, and so it, 
subsequently get forked into many different municipalities uh, because kind of the mayor of Tokyo bless uh, the civic tech into GovTech without taking control of it. And so we in the GovZero movement also help translating it. And I help translating uh, one kanji from the language selector which got noticed and um, haroseki san leader of Code for Japan tweeted and then uh, city councilor retweeted and then the mayor of Tokyo retweeted it. So it again it looks like diplomatic but yeah. it's actually just GitHub collaboration. Yeah, no, that's yeah. great. What do you think is the general digital literacy of mm -hmm. most mm -hmm. most people here in Taiwan? But also oh, we don't use that word anymore. Uh, okay, that's yeah, great. Starting a, a, couple, a couple of years ago, uh, we switched to the word competence. Competence, uh, Right, so because that. literacy is when you're a reader or yeah. a viewer, right? Competence is when you're a producer. And yeah. because in Taiwan, broadband is a human right that's bidirectional. So anyone can start a live stream anytime. Mm -hmm. uh, in that sense, everyone is media. And so it's media competence, not literacy, because literacy is when there's still asymmetry and there's still broadcasters and receivers. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, I, I guess, um, you know, my last question for you is, where do you see, you know, Civic Tech of Tech 10 years from now? Mm -hmm. What is your... 10 years from now? Yeah, uh, 10 years from yeah, now. By now, by that time, we'll finish the Sustainable Development Goals. <laughs> <laughs> All the goals will be goals. met. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah okay. that's right. No goals left behind. <laughs> and and I think um, civic tech, instead of uh, people thinking that technology is mostly natural science and industrial applications, I think by that time people will recognize that uh, social science is also science. Um, uh, open space technology is also tech. I mean, it says it's tech. Uh, Nonviolent communication is tech. Right, so anything that organizes the society differently uh, toward uh, decarbonization and so on, these are also tech. So, so our association uh, with the word tech will fundamentally change and will take a, I guess, civic first uh, association with the uh, word tech. And only then will people see that um, it, it, if the accountability and measurement mechanism is mature enough so that people can see all the externalities that we're making as part of the industrial application of technology, then people will make civic-minded choices kind of by default. Mm -hmm. um, instead of now, it's a, a little bit like playing, you know, uh, putting out fire. Are you working in a disinformation countering space? You know what I'm talking about, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's so a civic by default. Yeah, no, that's great. Oh, sorry, I actually have one last question for you sure, sure. that's always, you know, been top of my mind. Sure, of course. Is, um, I, you know, I grew up in Silicon Valley and saw a lot of innovation happen around uh -huh. me, and a lot of it is venture backed, right? Sure. And we're seeing a movement where there's more and more gov tech startups that uh -huh. are uniquely uh, standalone, uh -huh. but a lot of times most companies, enterprise companies especially, have, you know, government clients as an afterthought, as a first. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts in general mm -hmm. for uniquely civic tech or gov tech related startups yeah. thriving in this future sure. of what you just described? Yeah, um, I think uh, right now the U.S. is having a conversation that we had in 2016 about the word infrastructure. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> right, uh, where we move from incentives to equity, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and, and in 2016, uh, we uh, convinced the National Budgeting Office that even though something that's not concrete, like literally not made out of concrete, um, is still infrastructure if it is part of the commons. If if it's the digital equivalent of a uh, national museum, uh, like the digitalization, uh, the like photogrammetry uh, and videogrammetry of all the heritage sites, uh, th and that's national museum, but on the digital space, right? Uh, the kind of deliberative space we just talked about that qualifies as the digital equivalent of a town hall. Uh, and this metaphor can be used in many ways, right? right? The national park could also be digitalized and so on. So this digital public infrastructure, we argue uh, are worth uh, the special infrastructure bills, infrastructure money, even though it could not be classified as a traditional infrastructure investment because it's not made out of concrete. So, um, and, then, and we eventually got uh, what we wanted. So in our forward-looking infrastructure plan, the digital chapter is shaped very differently and doesn't have to be a concrete investment, uh, but still we can use public money to say broadband is a human right, to do all sorts 
sort of things that uh, make sure that uh, the access to health, the access to education, to telecommunication, and democratic participation um, actually is uh, higher uh, in rural places than in urban places, like flipping the uh, construction priorities around. And so, and, and that's all because uh, it qualifies as infrastructure. Uh, and so, I think the um, when I talk about civic first, uh, I have in mind that those ventures should be backed by a structure more like funding academic research. Mm -hmm. Indeed, the Taiwanese equivalent of Reddit, the PTT, um, is funded by national Taiwan universities and Taiwan academic network. So it's subsidized, but uh, the state doesn't control it, right? So it's like public radio or television. Um, the public governing body and everybody on GitHub really, uh, because it's open source and co-governance, uh, yeah. controls PTT, uh, but PTT doesn't have to answer to any advertisers or any shareholders, which is partly why Dr. Lee Wallace's message got triaged so quickly on PTT and uh, was uh, lost in the noise in other anti-social social media around the world. It's because, well, polarization um, may sell there, yeah. Um, so advertisements, but here we don't have advertisement in such public spaces, and so we don't have to do the democratic deliberation in the digital equivalent of a you know nightclub, very loud shouting, um, addictive drinks, private bouncers. <laughs> so we actually do have a civic infrastructure. So just fund them exactly the same way we fund local parks and national parks would be my uh, suggestion. Oh no, I like I love that. That's uh -huh. great. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was gonna say, can I get a picture with you? Is that possible? Sure. Sure. Of course. Okay. Oh,